of election <coughs> monitors are about to be deployed to ensure that, you know, when the judgment is made by the OSC and others that it was free and fair, if that is their judgment, that there will have been enough coverage of the election uh, uh, balloting posts. Um, on the last point, let me go on reverse order. On the election observers, there will be a lot of election observers there. There's a domestic network there, ISFED, that's uh, been trained and has operated through previous Georgian elections. Um, they are up and running around the country. Um, they've produced some preliminary reports on what they are hearing and seeing. The uh, long-term observers from ODIR are on the ground now. Um, that mission is led by um, Nikolai Volkanov, a Bulgarian who previously was the number two in ODIR for 10 years. I mean, he has run election observer missions across the OSC region. He's as good as they come. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence in his ability to manage all the political um, turmoil that will be around him uh, and come up with a, as straight an assessment as is possible. So there will be, uh, and there are a number of other uh, and then NDI and IRI are, have been deploying uh, election missions, and we'll have some there around Election Day. And there are a number of others, uh, sort of less um, less famous perhaps, but other uh, NGO efforts that are underway to monitor the election process. So I think there'll be a lot of information available. And uh, you know, my view has always been, the more observers, the better. They may not all agree with each other, but it's the same principle as having you know more newspapers, the better. They may, you, know, you don't learn all the same things from the different newspapers in this town, for instance, but uh, if you have multiple sources of information, you're more likely to get closer to the truth. So I think there will be a lot of observers. We'll have a lot of information um, between now and Election Day and on the morning after. Typically, uh, the U.S. government and the European Union uh, wait until after the, uh, o the ODIR and other major delegations offer their considered assessments, uh, preliminary assessments on the afternoon after the election before we we opine. We definitely want to wait to see what all the people on the ground say before we weigh in. Uh, that's our general policy, and I think it'll be respected here. There are other delegations from the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, NATO Parliamentary Assembly, and others that will be there. There'll be a lot of observers. Um, on the question of um, the citizenship for uh, Bidzina Ivanashvili, um, that's a, a complicated, torturous uh, story. Uh, the way it's played out, um, uh, it's very unusual. I mean, a lot of things about the Georgian election and political process are distinct. Um, and uh, I think uh, we've arri they have arrived at a place where he's allowed to participate. Um, he's clearly become a major political force in, uh, in Georgian politics. Um, I, I don't know that it's helpful to comment on the, the circuitous route they got to get to this point. Um, but he's there, he's in, and he can participate as he wants to. Um, Sorry, the second. Georgian dream. Oh, the, well, the, oh, the, the enforcement of the laws and the finance laws. Well, you know, the, 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 the record is clear. When Ivanashvili uh, announced that he was going to get involved in politics and launched Georgian dream uh, just about a year ago now, in October, I think, last year, um, he represented a significant new element in Georgian politics. Um, at about that time, soon after that, uh, new campaign finance laws were enacted that uh, and, and this, uh, and new powers were assigned to this um, state audit agency, the Chamber of Control, um, and it has been vigorously enforcing the campaign finance laws. Um, uh, the government officials and the audit office say that most of the money, and therefore most of the potential problems in campaign finance are associated with Georgian Dream. Therefore, it is natural that most of their investigation should focus on potential and real problems associated with their adherence to the campaign finance laws. Others say that it's been, um, you know, selective implement implementation. What do we say? Well, um, it's clear that, uh, well, I'll make two points. One is that it's troubling that the leadership of this office, as the campaign, you know, during, the, they were leading the office from last year, from the turn of the year through the summer. The director and the deputy director turned up last month as parliamentary candidates for the government party. That creates a perception of uh, lack of disinterestedness in the process. The fact that the new chairman of the office is a former member of parliament for the government party adds to that disquiet. Um, might have been better to have a retired law professor or another CPA or somebody like that to do this kind of job, but it is what it is. So they, the, the way that the appointments were, were made to that agency have created a, a political cloud over its operation. Uh, the fact that it has been very vigorously enforcing uh, rulings and investigations against mainly against the Georgian dream speaks for itself, I think. 
Mr. Thank Cameron. you. Uh, Mr. Ambass, uh, Secretary. I haven't uh, been become an ambassador yet. Yeah, I realize that quickly, Mr. <laughs> Secretary. Uh, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the Georgian process. What type of equipment do they use to vote on? That's a good question. Um, paper ballots? Paper ballots? Check the box? Count them up at the end of the day? So what, what, what should an observer be looking for? Um, that might be a longer conversation we could have in your office if you like before you go. But generally, there's you know there's the environment around the voting booth, right? I mean, if the voting booth is the epicenter of election day, um, and in the ideal scenario, an informed voter goes into a booth and, confident that his vote is secret, casts uh, the ballot in the way he prefers. Um, how do you get to that point? You get to that point through a series of reinforcing uh, measures. How do you get the informed voter? That goes to the media question. The, are the candidates and the political parties able to get their message out to all the voters they're trying to reach? Is the interested voter able to access all the information he wants about the choices before him? So the you know, information environment leading up to election day is critical. Um, is, the, is the process fair? Will, will the votes be counted accurately? That goes to how the election commissions are appointed, who's, on, who's going to be in All that is, is, is over and beyond what I'll be able to observe right. in that day. Uh, I mean, am I going to, you know, are they going to be putting, taking votes out of their pocket? And well, um, among the allegations of potential ways in which the uh, vote counting might be skewed are that uh, people will be suborned or bribed or persuaded to uh, uh, take pictures on their cell phones of their ballots to prove that they marked them the correct way that somebody told them to, whether it's their boss or their neighborhood, you know, block leader or whoever, um, or whether there's a, you know, there's uh, rumors afoot that uh, you know people will be, there will be cameras, uh, you know, monitoring people. Um, that people will be given inducements to vote one way or the other. Some of that you might be able to see or hear about. Much of it you may not be able to see as a casual observer not speaking the local language. Yeah, it's going to be tough not speaking, you know, Georgian. Looking I mean, I can speak with a drawl, but I don't think that'll work. It's a different kind of Georgian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you can tell a lot, though. You can tell a lot as, a, as an experienced political person yourself. Um, you can walk into a polling place and you can tell whether there's a, an atmosphere of um, anxiousness fear, concern. Do they have any rules about how many feet you have to be away from the ballot area, N distrib distribution of literature, or wearing a paraphernalia in the votings? They, they may well. I don't know what the numbers are, but I'm sure that there's that's specified, and you'll that'll be part of the briefing material that you would have if you're part of the OSCE. Yeah, there will be a briefing, and if you have any other information, I'd be interested. There are issues about, uh, for instance, uh, in, this, in this particular context, it's perhaps more important than whether political party agents can be uh, at, out in front of the uh, polling place is where the police and other security forces might be. And this is one of the, one of the emerging uh, things that we're watching because we want to avoid a situation in which there's some uh, effort to provoke confrontations around the polling place. At some point in the recent past, some members of the opposition have said that they want to make sure their people are poised to defend the ballot from miscounting or otherwise. Um, and that sounded like crowds might be gathering at polling places during the counting, and that might lead to some provocations with police or members of the other party. The, we did talk to the Minister of Interior that oversees the police, and we've urged them to be responsible in managing any, any uh, crowds, any uh, demonstrations that arise. And they're alert to that. There have been political demonstrations in the past that have led to uh, larger violence and larger confrontation. And so they're aware of that. And some, you know, our government and some European governments have provided training on crowd management, riot control, things like that. Do, the do, do they have, like we have, the, the rights for both parties to have observers? Mm -hmm. They yep. do have that. They will, they will be there. And, will they, and did both parties have the rights to be present to count the ballots? Yep, they will be. And just to be clear, there's at least uh, three. There's another uh, major party that will be a significant player in the race, the Christian Democratic Movement. But the UNM and the Georgian Dream are the two larger ones consistently in the polling that's been done. But this Christian Democratic movement is not insignificant either. Has there been any polling that you have been privy to that you can discuss that gives you any indication of how the uh, uh, likely voters would vote? There is a, there's a lot of polling that's been going on, uh, some of it by um, NDI and IRI, our American party institutes that are on the ground there. 
Um, each of the campaigns has commissioned polls um, and selectively published them when they seem politically useful. Um, um, there's a, in, the, in this political environment, there's a major discussion about how to allocate undecided voters or people who decline to express a preference. The various pollsters have adopted different techniques for allocating the undecided to you know, make assumptions you know, based on their political skills about where those voters might go on election day. So that has led to some um, competing narratives about where public opinion is in Georgia. Um, so I mean, that's all, there's a lot of that publicly available that can be. What are the NDI and the, IR, the, the Republican they have, polls? They there? have generally showed that the government party uh, remains uh, the most popular, that the Georgian dream uh, rose in popularity as the year went on, and the most recent ones that were published in August showed a, strike, uh, a dropping away of the Georgian dream. So the gap between them and the government party was widening in the last month. What, what, is, what are the issues that have, have been raised in the campaign? Well, the polling shows that what voters mostly care about, and this will not be surprising to you, is jobs and the economy. Um, and the campaigns in different ways have spoken to that with their different claims. So um, that, you know, Georgia, like any other uh, country these days, th those are the major uh, things that voters uh, say they want the campaigns to speak to, and, and they, they have done that in their way. There's, they've had their public, they've had public debates, the public forums. As I said, the campaigns are able to get out and around, and they are, they are campaigning. And so the, the, the must-carry law, which I had not heard that term, and uh, from where I'm from, I would think that would involve, you know, sidearms. <laughs> Fortunately, it's not what it is. Or a photo ID, which is a, no, not such a wonderful. But what do they have to carry? I mean, is there a, a, each station has to give equal time, each network, each broadcast or whatever, or equal time to buy, equal opportunity? Um, I don't think it's, it, well, there's, there's campaign advertising. There's purchased advertising space on billboards and radio and television. But there's also, uh, because of the, generally aligned nature of the different networks. Um, the question was whether they could, they'd be obliged to carry other, the other camps uh, version of the news and uh, discussion shows. So I don't think there's a, I, again, I'm, maybe I'm, I, I don't think there's a financial implication to that. I think it's just a requirement that they carry the other side. And, and with the advertising, have they, if, is one side, is it unlimited amount of TV and radio or the, did these laws limit how much one could spend? I can't speak to the details of that. I'm sorry, Congressman. And do you know what the what the ads are like? Are they, you know, the two sides? Is it just we'll get more jobs and we need more jobs, or is it Jane, you ignorant? Uh, I, I did not see a sampling of the campaign advertisements, I confess. That's okay. a good question. If I was smarter, I would have done that last week. Uh, do you have any, the Georgian dream, uh, which I have to think about the American dream, and that's one of our lines, uh, is do you have, give me some impression of what, the, if the Georgian dream is successful in the election, what they would bring to uh, a difference in the Georgian government and how that might affect our relations with Georgia? Most of the analysts of the campaign platforms that I have seen uh, including our embassy reporting, say that there are not significant differences in the way they describe what they would do for the economy, for the jobs, and so on. Um, whether um, the Georgian dream would adopt a notably different foreign policy or have a different kind of relationship with the United States, that's a, that's a contested item. Um, um, when I met with Mr. Ivanishvili at the start of last week, um, he spoke uh, very uh, passionately about his commitment to Euro-Atlantic integration, to Georgia's aspirations for NATO membership and EU membership, for continuing a strong relationship with the United States. Um, so uh, others will say that uh, that represents some dissembling, that he's, uh, he would change Georgia's foreign policy, but I, you know, we have no way to know what, what that would mean in the end. You know, we, we can't predict what the foreign policy would be in a Georgian dream-led parliament or government. Um, what we know fundamentally is that we want a government that the Georgian people have elected. That's been our focus in this process. It's not our job to parse their uh, stated or presumed, you know, policy inclinations down the road. 
Um, that's for the Georgian people to decide. Now, as I understand, he, he was he from Russia. He's a Georgian, born uh, Georgian, well, citizen in the end, um, and uh, spent much of his adult life in Russia, making his fortune. In he what area? How did he make his fortune? No. Um, banking, money management, things like that. Banking, uh, the American dream. <laughs> he, uh, he left Russia a few years ago. He's been living in Paris for a number of years uh, before he returned to Georgia uh, more full-time, essentially a year, year and a half ago. So he didn't come straight from Russia, is my point. He, he moved out of Russia six or eight years ago, went to Paris, France, was there, uh, and then he came back to Georgia. Thank you. Just two brief questions to follow up and, or, or to conclude. Uh, in cyber um, subversion by, uh, of Georgian Dream, and do we have any information as to who might have done that? Um, uh, what's the origins of it? And secondly, with the Caucus 212 military exercises, the, is that intended in any way to affect the outcome of the, of the elections? Um, we've recently heard the concerns expressed about some cyber attacks on Georgian Dream uh, computer sites and computers and so on. I don't know the details of that. This has just recently come to my attention, and uh, uh, we've asked for more information. Would like Could you get that back to us, too? Sure, you I get can that. follow up that would be very good. Um, in the days to come if we learn anything uh, conclusive or interesting about that. So we've heard the allegation, but we don't know what to make of it, honestly. Um, as for the uh, Russian and CSTO uh, military exercises, there's one underway in southern Russia to Georgia's north and one underway in Armenia. Um, um, my understanding is that the Kavkaz 2012 exercise, the principal uh, one that's happening in the Russian Federation to the north, has been long planned. We certainly knew about it long ago. In fact, uh, it was planned before the election date was clarified. Oh, okay. um, well familiar with the Georgia-Russia dynamic, um, but uh, we've, we have also uh, encouraged the, the Russians and their, their uh, partners in those military exercises to uh, try to avoid anything that could be interpreted as uh, provocative. Um, we shall see. Is there, uh, Secretary, anything you want to add before we conclude? No, just that uh, I'm glad that some members will be able to uh, visit Georgia around the election. That will uh, add to our collective wisdom, and uh, w we can revisit where we are in the days after that. I look forward to hearing your, your readout from your visit there. Um, Georgians in the government and in the opposition are among the best friends the United States has anywhere in the world, and uh, I think we're reminded in the last week uh, that we should cherish that. Um, so uh, we go into this with... Uh, uh, a strong sense of partnership with, with Georgia as a society and as a country, and uh, mindful of the important uh, accomplishments uh, of this government, and also um, alert to some of the things we'd like them to be you know, doing better going forward and strengthening their democratic systems. And as part of that, that moving along that trajectory toward consolidation with uh, NATO and EU and the Western Alliance. Secretary, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. I'd like to now welcome our second panel uh, to the witness table, beginning with uh, Dr. Archel Gigishidze, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies, where he lectures on globalization and development, as well as providing training in policy analysis at GFSIS. Prior to joining GFSIS, he was a Fulbright Scholar at Stanford University. Dr. Gigishidze uh, worked for the Georgian government from 1992 to 2000. During that time, he was assistant to the head of state on national security and chief foreign policy advisor to the president. We'll then hear from Dr. Ariel Cohen, who is a senior research fellow for Russian and Eurasian studies and international energy policy in the Catherine and Shelby uh, Colum Davis Institute for International Studies at the Heritage Foundation. A commentator in great demand, he covers a wide range of issues, including economic development and uh, political uh, reform in the former Soviet republics, U.S. energy security, the global war on terrorism, and the continuing conflict in the Middle East. Dr. Cohen's book, Russian Imperialism, Development and Crisis, came out in 1996 as well as in 1998. He also co-authored and edited Eurasia in Balance in 2005, 
which focuses on the power shift in the region after September 11 attacks. He has written nearly 500 articles and 25 book chapters. We will then hear, thirdly, uh, from Dr. Uh, Mamuka uh, Tesserelia, who is the director of the Center for Black Sea Caspian Studies at the School of International Service at American University, where he teaches classes on international economic policy and energy and security in Europe and Central Eurasia. He frequently speaks about the international relations in the Caucasus and the Central Asia political, economic developments, energy, security, and country risk analysis. Uh, Dr. Tessarelli serves as the president of the America Georgia Business Council and the president of the Georgian Association in the United States of America, USA. He is a board member of the American Friends of Georgia, the Georgian Reconstruction and Development Fund, the Business Initiative for Reforms uh, in Georgia and the American Academy of Georgia. Dr. Tessarelli previously served uh, as the economic counselor at the Embassy of Georgia in Washington, covering relationships with international financial institutions, U.S. assistance programs, uh, and business initiatives. Uh, Dr. Cohen, if you could proceed first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, the staff, for doing a terrific job day in and day out on a number of issues that I follow, including on Russia. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am covering Georgia since 93, so it's almost 20 years. I've been in the country many times, uh, wrote a monograph about Russia-Georgia war. I've also been election observer uh, in uh, Russia, Albania, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and other countries. So it is indeed uh, an important uh, election that we're facing that will define not only who and how rules Georgia, but also will be crucial for U.S.-Georgian relations. Um, Georgia is a geopolitical centerpiece in that part of the world. Uh, President Saakashvili, uh, developed a uh, policy of Georgia building on the policies of his predecessor, Eduard Shevardnadze, uh, bringing Georgia away from the Russian sphere of influence and um, uh, building a strong relationship with the United States. His challenger, uh, the Georgia Dream Coalition headed a billionaire, Bidzina Ivanishvili, has deep ties to Russia. Ivanishvili built his 6.4 billion fortune, as was mentioned before, in the opaque Russian business world, primarily in banking. And uh, jokes aside, Russian banking is not the same as American banking. Um, so this year, we found out that Mr. Vanishvili sold uh, the majority of his assets to business people who are directly and closely connected to the Kremlin. Transactions like that do not happen in Russia without an explicit approval and blessing from the Kremlin. Um, the rhetoric of this campaign is far from uh, courteous. The Ivanishvili-led opposition is not mincing world, words. Its leader called Saakashvili, quote, son of a dog, and, quote, professional liar, unquote. In Russia and many neighboring countries, such language would earn the opposition leader a jail term or worse. Not in Georgia. In fact, recent media monitoring uh, that was already discussed by um, Deputy Assistant Secretary Amelia, also found that the press coverage, printed press, is pro-opposition. When they did content analysis on photography, President Saakashvili came out uh, with more negative uh, coverage uh, in terms of pictures, whereas radio was neutral and TV channels are polarized. As was mentioned, the national channels uh, being more pro-government and uh, three other channels being pro-opposition. There are serious accusations against, against uh, the government uh, ruling party and the government practices. Georgia Dream accused uh, United National Movement, led by Saakashvili, of abuse of office, firing supporters of Georgia Dream from their jobs, and other tran transgressions. It also claims that a small group of cronies surrounding Saakashvili holds Georgia in an iron gri grip. If so, it is difficult to understand why uh, IRI and NDI polls demonstrate about 20% lead for the UNM 
about 55% against Georgia Dream, 35%. And Georgia Dream is not lacking for money. Uh, so the electorate in these elections have a real choice. After all, the ruling party took Georgia through a disastrous war with Russia in 2008 and a deep economic crisis. Georgian voters may have had enough of perennially active Saakashvili, who is currently moving the parliament to Kutaisi, the second largest town in the country, rel and relocated Georgia's Supreme Court in the coastal town of Batumi. But this is not what the poll data show. In addition, speaking of poll da data, the pollsters who work for the ruling party are accusing opposition uh, of manipulating polling results, projecting much higher numbers than the Western-funded uh, polling. So what I see, comparing to other places I did election observation, and having been in Georgia not too long ago in summer, is a highly competitive election, which is an achievement in itself. Let's not forget, the Georgian political system as we see it is functioning only for nine years, and the Soviet rule ended 20 years ago. Horrible information came yesterday and day before, I believe, or yesterday and today, about abuses in the Georgian prison system. The recent revelations are of systemic torture, horrified Georgians and foreigners alike. Such horrors should not be tolerated, especially in a country which aspires to integrate into Euro-Atlantic institutions. However, unfortunately, such despicable abuses happen everywhere, as we remember from our own Abu Ghraib scandal in a number of U.S. prison systems, recently in Alabama and Michigan, where court settlements were reached involving hundreds of claimants, uh, and in a country like Albania, which is a NATO and EU candidate. It is encouraging that the Georgian leadership uh, promised an impartial investigation leading to a comprehensive reform. We should not expect anything less than that. But looking broadly, by the standard of, standards of the former Soviet region, these are, as I said, highly competitive election with access not just to the media, but also with reports of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people attending rallies for the ruling party and for the opposition. The Georgian voters are informed and will have an opportunity to exercise their vote and having elections on the election observers on the ground is extremely important and crucial, and I do have confidence in the ODIHR and OSCE observers uh, doing their job, and we should wait for their reports. Unlike many countries where anti-American sentiment is rising, including Russia, Iran, Turkey, uh, Georgia is truly different. President George W. Bush has a street named after him in the Georgian capital. Oil, gas, commodities, and finished goods worth of hundreds of millions of dollars move through Georgia on a daily basis. Its geopolitical role alongside the Black Sea is abutting oil and gas, which Azerbaijan on the Caspian is crucial. In case of a scenario vis-a-vis -vis Iran, Georgia is also going to be geopolitically very, very important. Uh, we heard about the maneuvers, the maneuvers uh, by the Russians that led to the war in 2008 may create an intimidating effect uh, if they occur before the elections as planned. So this is a, we're at a determining point. And uh, in the recent years, in this country, in this city, in this administration, Focusing blindly on democratic process excluding all other our national interest had become somewhat of a fashion. We're seeing the results in the Middle East. The previous U.S. administration and the current one encouraged elections in Gaza that brought Hamas to power, uh, encouraged the Muslim Brotherhood to contest seats in Egyptian parliament 
under the previous regime encouraged the elections that brought the Muslim bro Brotherhood administration in Egypt with the results in the long term that may be severely detrimental for American national interest. Clearly, Georgia is no Egypt. Saakashvili is no Mubarak. Georgia, one hopes, would rise on, for the occasion and conduct elections with minimal violations, let alone violence. And let me quote uh, the former Assistant Secretary of State and my boss, Kim Holmes, quote, free and fair